So, welcome to this Roger Dialogue. Uh, we have the honor today here to have Professor Mary O'Sullivan here from University of Geneva, where she's a professor of economic history and director of the Department of History, Economics and Society. And she's here in Stockholm because yesterday she gave the LIF Heckscher Lecture, the yearly lecture that's giving at Stockholm School of Economics. And the title of Mary's lecture was An Intelligent Woman's Guide to Capitalism. And uh, we're here to discuss capitalism for a few moments. And uh, why do we need a guide to understand capitalism? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here in Stockholm. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, pleasure to have you here. Talk about capitalism and why we might need to be guided uh, to understand it. Um, so I think the, there's certainly been a renewed interest in thinking about capitalism and its history, its economics in recent years. We see uh, that interest among historians, um, but we also see the interest among economists. And... Um, on the one hand, you have people who really advocate the use of the concept of capitalism as an analytical one, one that can really help us to understand very important developments in the history of economic activity in the world. Um, but there's also contention about it, controversy about whether speaking in terms of capitalism is a way of getting more understanding of the world we live in. So some people have argued that it's actually a very vague concept, it's a polemical one, and adding it to uh, debates that we have about inequality or innovation or any number of uh, themes that we're interested in discussing with relationship to the economy may in fact cloud the issues rather than clarify them. Can you really define a concept like this? I mean, the economy, capitalism itself is evolving, it's changing due to new technologies, globalization, new institutions that evolve, new conflicts that occur. What's your view on this? Uh, There's no question, I think, that one of the most striking features of a capitalist system from a historical point of view is indeed its flexibility, its protean character, its capacity to renew itself all the time. Um, one can only be struck by that as soon as we think we have something we might refer to as industrial capitalism. We enter a post-industrial age where the rules of the game appear to change or financial capitalism. Um, but in many ways, I think that... Um, by the same token, uh, what is very striking when one looks in the history of economic thought is the, is the history of economic activity, rather, is that this relentless pursuit of profit uh, through the accumulation of capital is certainly a phenomenon that seems to stand out as a particular characteristic of uh, a specific age. And I think when people who use capitalism in, in an analytical way um, uh, justify it, it is because it seems to speak to that very particular behavior that certainly characterizes our societies today. Um, What's needed to understand this, uh, well, the basis of profit and capital accumulation and uh, its relationships, what methods, what theories should we use in order to understand this very complex development that goes on? So in my talk yesterday, um, the main theme is that uh, for historians and for economists, um, there is a remarkable uh, inattention to the important, the central role, I would argue, of profit in capitalism. Uh, and on the one hand, that sounds like a surprising statement, because if you ask an economist to characterize what happens in our economy, they speak constantly in terms of the maximization of profit. But, but still, neoclassical economics don't allow for profits or anything. Yeah, so I think that's the irony. On the one hand, it's we a paradox. In it's a, sense. It, is, it is a real paradox. Um, I don't believe, in fact, that that this perspective on the economy that profits don't exist or that they wash out in some sort of long term is a viable explanation of the economies we live in. And what the lecture yesterday was really a call for is a serious attention to the history and economics of, of profit among um, uh, scholars today. As to how you go about that. Um, I think the question of which methods you use, I'm fairly Catholic in my tastes uh, with regard to methodologies. Uh, I think there's any number of ways we can illuminate um, these issues through statistical methods, but also through archival sources, uh, trying to understand how indeed capitalists in the past understood what profits even meant, um, because that was different from the way we understand it. You argue 
extensively and, and convincingly that there's a lot of bad economics, there's a lot of bad history done within academia, um, but how should we do it in a proper way in order to understand it? Yeah, the, the, the bad has a very specific meaning in the context of my work on profit, uh, bad in the sense that I think there is a tendency to use capitalism for rhetorical purpose rather than analytical purpose. Um, and when it's used that way, I think it leads to confusion. Um, and so what I'm, it's a kind of call to arms to say, you know, if you really want to take capitalism seriously, um, there are many things you might look at. But if you're not really telling us about what the relationship between capitalism and profit is, you're missing a very central aspect of this. Um, that's what the call to arms is about. And it says that uh, it, it goes after um, historians and economists who invoke this term um, across ideological boundaries, it must be said, um, without being um, very specific about this relationship that I see at least, and I'm certainly not the only one. I would argue that everybody who's used uh, capitalism in a serious analytical way, uh, be it Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, be it Karl Marx, uh, be it any number of thinkers in the past, have in fact looked to the relationship between um, capital and profit or capital and surplus, the terms differ a little bit, um, to really illuminate the dynamics of this type of economic you mentioned system. You mentioned a number of classical scholars that you cherish. I mean, Thorsten Veblen would be one of them. You mentioned Marx. You mentioned Schumpeter. But you also, uh, in your paper today that you presented, uh, you got a lot of interest to, to the work by, by Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz about the monetary history of the U.S., what makes such, if you take this last example, what makes it good and what makes it bad from your perspective? Um, so I, I think my uh, work in economics uh, is characterized by a certain eclecticism in terms of the influences. I, I see that as a strength. Not everybody does, I'm sure. Um, but I have been inspired and take the time to read carefully the work of people whose ideologies I don't necessarily share and Friedman and Schwartz are uh, notable in that regard. Um, I think that their interpretation of the Great Depression has become a type of orthodoxy uh, in history and economics to help us understand what happened during the Great Depression and in a very unusual way was mobilized during the recent crisis to teach lessons about how par policymakers um, in our time should uh, deal with this um, uh, great crisis that they confronted. And I think that what is admirable about the work of Friedman and Schwartz is how carefully they do the historical analysis. Solid empirical historical work, yeah. Uh, indeed, um, based on primary source material uh, in the way that many historians like to work. Um, and on the other hand, I can say that and at the same time completely disagree with their interpretation of the Great Depression. Um, so uh, from my point of view, scholarship is not like joining a club. It's not about always agreeing with the people with whom you um, engage, whether they're dead or alive. And many of mine are dead. Um, but it's about using criticism, sustained criticism and skepticism to draw what is valuable from their work and to leave behind or criticize. That's the uh, good academic method, right? right. Uh, opposition, uh, critical thinking about what others have done, yes. Uh, a question that... Uh, touch upon, I think, both in your lecture and, and your paper today, is um, whether the capitalistic system is stable or instable. And, and looking from all the crises and bubbles we see, it seems to be quite instable, right? How should we understand this? Is it due to the logic or internal working of the system itself, or is it due to well, interventions and crony capitalism or whatever, bad policies that influences how the system works. What's your view? Uh, to me, I think um, I've come to a view that sees capitalism as inherently unstable. Um, but this is related to the feature that you evoked uh, early on in our discussion, which is about its constantly changing mm. character. Mm. Uh, that means that it's constantly pushing into new area. So in many ways, the fact that it doesn't, uh, can't stabilize itself um, is not terribly surprising. And we find that insight in many different uh, types of thinkers. You mentioned Schumpeter, who is a very good example. Um, but Joseph Schumpeter took that insight from Karl Marx. Um, and I think that Marx really developed perhaps the most compelling explanation of 
uh, this inherent tendency to crisis and, si uh, and cycles within capitalism. He was one of the most precocious thinkers, I think, in this regard, though not the first. Um, and so I think that, yes, I, I, I agree with that, um, while at the same time saying that we don't uh, fully understand what it is about um, capitalism which makes it so unstable. I think the answer is to be found, um, as some other thinkers in the past have thought as well, by looking at how the dynamics of profit-seeking operate. Um, that's my hunch, and it's more than a hunch, if you like. Um, but um, we will see whether I can make a compelling case out of that. To extend a bit your discussions that you had yesterday and today, um, institutions matter here, of course. Capitalism depends on private property rights, freedom of contract, well, a basic set of institutions to, to provide Wait, the wage labor. Wage labor, mm -hmm. of course, uh, well, incorporated companies with limited liability, banking system, financial systems that all rest on institutions. And given the fact that capitalism evolves all the time, that also implies, I guess, that institutions have to be developed and improved over time as well? Well, I think one question, I think this is a question that divides along ideological grounds in terms of the answers that people give, is whether the role of institutional, uh, political institutions perhaps specifically, yeah. though there are other types of institutions, sure. is to adapt to capitalism or to constrain it. Um, and so if I take the work of Thomas Piketty, for, for sure. example, the argument that he's making is really that um, we see both. We see in his latest book, for example, called Cap Capital and Ideology, he argues that societies uh, develop institutions to justify certain patterns of inequality that, that characterize their um, societies and economies. And on the other hand, um, he is an advocate of institutional change in order to change those patterns of inequality. Um, so you see both elements operating in his work. Um, and I th think that many thinkers who are interested in the role of institutions often come down uh, in favor of either one potential role for institutions or the other. Um, so controlling uh, capitalism, um, as many people think the Swedish model of capitalism did in the post-World War II period, or facilitating it, as many, I think, neoliberal thinkers uh, following people like Hayek have argued uh, in uh, recent decades that cap institutions need to be there to facilitate um, capitalist activity. Uh, so I think if you interview uh, different people from the social science or history, you get very different answers about which side of that discussion they come down on. It's a very interesting discussion that we could continue for a long time, I think. And, and uh, it seems to me like all c institutions are constraints. That would be North's definition of institutions constraints on your behavior. And uh, even, I think, uh, if you have this, what you call more constraining perspective, you would like to develop institutions to make markets work better and be more efficient, right, to promote growth and prosperity and these kind of things, while controlling some aspects of it that you may find uh, less beneficial, perhaps. Perhaps, but I think that way of framing the issue is something of a trap, um, which is to say when I think about how economic activity is organized, I don't first and foremost think about markets as if they're some sort of disembodied um, phenomena, and certainly not actors. Markets don't act. Um, I think um, sure. individuals and organizations are capable of action. Uh, they're influenced by the prices set uh, through market exchanges. But I think that talking in a disembodied way about economic activity as if um, we could think of markets as having this kind of role is problematic. And once we think about organizations, be they firms or other organizations, it becomes very clear that institutions are not just constraining, but they're also facilitating. For sure, for sure. And organizations need uh, institutions in order to be able to do certain... Many markets wouldn't exist without institutions, of course. If you take telecom market or, or digital markets of various kinds, you, you need, well, institutions or property rights or whatever or instructions for them to work in any way, you know. So yes, I think, I the, think the, the way in which we structure institutions, you, get, you gave the example of globalization earlier on, uh, very much affects about who 
very much affects who benefits from For the sure. type of behavior that is facilitated. And this is the critique that, that some people have of the particular globalization that we have. It facilitates certain actors in their capacity cr to cross borders and very much limits other actors in yeah. their capacity to do similarly. Uh, we see this with refugee crises, with migration as a problem in general. Which implies that institutions matter in that sense, yes. Yeah, certainly. They may be good or bad just as good or bad economics. Coming back and to trying to finish this off a little bit, um, you, you um, believe that economics and history need each other and we should try to combine them in, in productive ways, so to speak, in order to understand what goes on in a better, better sense. Combining historical work, statistical work, but also more theoretical work. And um, in your paper today, you, you mentioned a term that, that um, apparently Freeman has used and Schwartz has used in their book, analytical narratives. Could you explain a bit what, what you mean by this when you use this term? I think one of the interesting things about the Friedman and Schwartz book is that um, despite the fact that both Anna Schwartz and Milton Friedman were accomplished uh, statisticians, they were well able to use mm -hmm. numbers and econometrics, um, the book is characterized by relatively simple statistical techniques and an extremely historical argument, an argument that's rooted in an analysis of temporality. Mm -hmm. um, so ultimately what they construct about the Great Depression is an analytical narrative of what happened. Uh, where sequence matters, where temporality matters. Where causality can be seen, I guess. Yes, uh, where a certain causality uh, can at least be argued to be seen. Um, which From is a simplified way, of course, <laughs> as always. <laughs> um, and so, um, though I don't agree necessarily with their interpretation of the Great Depression, I can admire their effort to integrate economics and history in this account, which is a very unusual thing to do for um, economists in the time that they wrote and was becoming less usual um, at just the time when they published that book in 1963. Um, so I suppose from a, 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 me a methodological point of view, I think their use of the term analytical narrative is a very interesting one. And I think many economists at the time were, would have been very uncomfortable with using the term narrative to describe what they would much prefer to describe as theory. Especially um, someone like Freeman, who's supposed to be extremely theoretical. Indeed, uh, indeed. And, you know, other people who've spoken of narratives in economics, like Deirdre McCluskey, yeah. um, is often seen as being a, her a heretic for that very reason. But I, I do really think that that's what the most that uh, economists can, um, can aspire to do, which is to, to propose certain types of analytical narrative to explain our present and our past. Um, and better to do that in a deliberate way, uh, and when you're looking at historical um, analysis, to really do the work of, of, of constructing the story based on primary source material, if you can, and uh, engaging with that um, through a particular analytical lens, while all the time aware that there could be another way of describing this story of causality that you're weaving. One way to summarize your message in a sense could be that uh, we need more competing narratives, analytical narratives of what goes on in the capitalistic system. Certainly. And I think for the Great Depression, which is the mm. most important crisis capitalism has ever confronted, uh, that's very much the conclusion of my talk today, mm. was that uh, what we need is, uh, is, is an, uh, a, a challenging of this argument of Friedman and Schwartz that has become the orthodoxy of the Great Depression. Um, the failure, I have argued uh, there, is that other people didn't follow Friedman and Schwartz's lead, or indeed uh, the lead of the people who inspired them, most notably Wesley Clare Mitchell, um, to produce these kinds of analytical narratives and to put them into competition with each other. But that's uh, from the point of view of the Great Depression of the 30s. Uh, that's really where I see the challenge lying. That sounds like a very good ending, I think view summarizing your your main message here thank you so much and thank um, you very much thank you for listening thank you very much